The Fact Check Podcast is hosted by three rehab professionals with decades of combined experience. But I'm not one of them. I'm just making this intro. If you are finding the world of health and musculoskeletal care confusing and contradicting, and let's be honest, at times a bit crazy, our efforts here are aimed against all that misinformation through real research and real evidence. Let's do this, people. Nothing you hear on this podcast should be considered medical advice. Hey, editing Alexis here. The audio quality on my mic isn't that good throughout this whole conversation. It's kind of clipping a little bit. I try to fix it as best as I can, but I hope you stay because the conversation was incredibly interesting. Uh, we've learned so much. And even though I did my research before, I was like so surprised at how much I learned. And I think we provide like a very interesting perspective on why the carnivore diet has became so popular. Um, and, you know, maybe how you can maybe apply it a little bit, or at least its principles, a little bit better and a little bit more healthily. So there's actually actionable advice. So we hope you stick around. The audio mishap won't happen again. I know how to fix it now, and or at least how to prevent it. All right, you guys have a good listen. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fact Check Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Elliot Sierra. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Adrian Chavez. Did I pronounce that right? Yep, you pronounced it correctly. All right. Uh, can you introduce yourself to the people that don't know you? I, I, su I suppose it's a very small contingent of people because a lot of people who follow us for the evidence most likely follow you for good evidence and nutrition. So go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I have a PhD in nutrition and health promotion. I got that quite a long time ago. Uh, since then, worked with a number of different people, uh, like hundreds of people in one-to-one -one work group, group uh group programs and all different types of, you know, actual experience with clients, which I think is really important when, you know, one thing of take, knowing the science, but actually the application of it is quite a, quite a different uh, topic altogether. So, you know, lots of experience on that realm of things, um, you know, been running a business for quite some time, you know, doing these things, teaching nutrition. I run a podcast called the Nutrition Science Podcast, uh, have a social media page where I put out content on a pretty regular basis uh, in, you know, all of it around just trying to help educate people about, uh, like you said, evidence-based nutrition, because most of what is out there is complete nonsense. And uh, it's really hard for people to actually find the right information. This topic doesn't have to be that challenging. Uh, it's really like for most people, unless you have a chronic health problem, uh, the topic of nutrition should be pretty simple. Um, but yeah. there's people that spend decades trying to figure out what to eat following all these different fads. And it's like, we just need the right education. So that's what I try to do. Yeah. And one thing I like about your page, and I think that's uh, something Elliot and I kind of struggle with is you break down misinformation in a way that's super kind. We like leave <laughs> kind of liking you, whereas it's like, Elliot and I do in a, I find I'm trying to get better with age, but we do it in a very destructive way. I feel like Elliot is going the other direction. He's trying to be even meaner. I got significantly nicer recently. I think it's just because Elliot started a business. So he's like in that Sigma male grind set kind of, kind of way. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to be nicer. Elliot, do you have anything to comment for your, your mean spirited uh, post lately? Yeah. I just, the second that I actually started my own business, I was like, you know what? I can actually do whatever the fuck I want and say whatever the fuck I want. And I'm not beholden to anyone. So let me just do that because yeah, that's actually yeah, who I no, am as a person. I, the funny thing is I get, I get a lot of comments saying that I am mean to people. And I feel like uh, I've tried to be nicer with time because what I have realized is that yes, being mean to people will get you more clout and we'll, we'll, we'll get like, more of your own followers to get excited about it but if you're actually trying to change people's mind and reach the people on the other side who are following the other people which is generally you know the purpose of of doing these these misinformation you know going after this is to help the people who are falling for this understand it uh when you come off mean they immediately disc like discount you sometimes and so you have to be like kinder in order to reach those people is what I have realized over time. So I try to, but sometimes I feel like I, I definitely uh, can can go off on people as well. Yeah, I think one saying that would resonate with that, and I mean, I'm probably the worst person to be saying this, is that people will not remember what you said, but they'll remember how you make them feel. 
And that's very true. Like you talk about someone, let's say it fizzled out with a woman or it went really bad. And it's like, what did they do? What did they say? You don't really remember, but you remember that it was you like, they remember you were awful or you remember that they were awful, even though we don't remember the specific words, but you know, it's kind of how that, memory that's, works. that's how influencers get popular. You know what I mean? They just, they make people feel good with the, with the stuff that they're saying there. Oh, the government's after you. It's, it wasn't, it's not your fault that, that your, yeah. your health is not great. It's the government that, that was destroying your health. And I'm here to help you wake up to this and, uh, you know, kind of find the truth. And it makes people feel, feel good that, oh, it's, it wasn't my fault. It's not that I was eating too many calories and, and my lifestyle habits were just not, yeah. not great. It's just the government has been waging war against my health for 40 years. And now yeah. this person came to wake me up and, and that makes people feel good. And that's one of the ways that that's one of the marketing strategies that a lot of people use in this space uh, to, to, Yep. Yeah, it's big exactly. fork propaganda. Dude, I actually got people DMing me from that, which was really scary. Like some people commented on the fake graph that I made and were like, I, I've known this for years. And I was like, fucking hell, man, yeah. shit. Um, the, God the, the damn thing it. you're talking about, it's called the just world fallacy. So this, this idea that humans kind of struggle with the lack of, that's the theory at least, they struggle with the idea that they don't really have a lot of control on the way they live and the way the world works. So it's just like, oh no, it's not it's just, you know, sometimes life is just unfair or I have like bad genetics. Um, it's just that, you know, there's this guy and if we just get this guy, things are going to be cool. It's like in the movies, there's always a bad guy. You know, there's very few movies that don't have a bad guy and there's probably a reason that's how brain works. Um, I'd say the only movie I can think of where there's no bad guys are maybe Ayao Miyazaki movies. And I'd say that's almost the purpose. It's just like most of his movies are about grief. It's like a little kid that uses their imagination because they're struggling with their mother dying or something. Um, mm -hmm. But the, I can't think of any other movies where there's not like one bad guy, especially American movies, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, okay, so today, if in case no one knows, we're talking about the carnivore diet. So we really wanted to have a, an expert. So we're glad you're here, Adrian, um, because we don't like to talk about like going outside of our lane. We try to stay away from that. So we prepared as much science as we can, but we really want you to you know tell us if we're wrong and expound with what we're, we're about what we're talking about mm -hmm. by giving us your experience and maybe especially about the mechanisms because i can read the data and look at the effects but i have no idea what that's working it's like oh okay like i get if we match the calories but there's a lot of things where it's like i don't even know what fiber does i just know it's important yeah, <laughs> yeah so the mechanisms um, are interesting. With, with, with this particular subject the mechanisms are a large part of the conversation for sure yeah exactly um, but today I wanted to start with uh, a little thing that I find is really analogous to the whole carnivore movement, but it's, it's from a while back. It's from around, I think, 1895. So are you guys familiar with the coconut cult? So um, it's a little known story. It's this German guy. His dad was a rich family worker. His name is a uh, rich, rich factory owner. His name was August Engelhardt. Uh, he was a German author. So when he was in university, he was studying physics and chemistry. He wrote a book called A Carefree Future in 1898. And then he decided to move to Papua New Guinea because apparently he read something like Indian Sutras or whatever, or someone was writing a book about what's called cocoaivorism, which is when you just, it's like the coconut is this perfect uh, thing for your soul. It has all the nutrients you need. You can just eat coconuts all day. It's like it has the milk, it has the, the, you know, the water, it's perfect for you. So he went to that island, which at the time was a German uh, island in the Bismarck archipelago. Now it's in Papua New Guinea. Interestingly enough, that's where the, there were the headhunters. You know, people would chop off your head. Um, but he decided to go there. <laughs> and what he did is he managed to convince people because of his book, people would come to the island and at its peak, there were 30 people. Um, just eating coconuts, but the, most of them just got sick, like really quickly. So one died within six weeks of coming. Um, there's a bunch that died, but basically it didn't stay long until it was so bad that Germany was like, no, we're banning immigration there. This is like too bad. This guy's a menace. And at some point that a couple, they got married there. Uh, I think it was also a nudist colony, by the way. But what they did is the one guy was just getting sick really quickly. And his wife was like, you need to eat more fruits. You can't just eat coconuts. And they, the guy got even more sick. And so the August, the guy, he was like, no, it's because of the 
is because you ate more than just coconuts. That's why you're sick. It's not because you have like a limited diet. It's just because you didn't stick to the <laughs> coconut diet. And then he actually managed to live just on coconuts. He died at 66 pounds when he was, he stayed, he survived that way for like 17 years. He died, he died at 40. And allegedly there's a legend going on that there's two other people that died. <laughs> Do you guys want to know how they died? Yes. I think, whatever, I'll tell you. Most of malnutrition. Them did, I don't know, but some of them apparently died because coconuts fell on their head, <laughs> so they died from like brain trauma. And yeah, so that's the story of the coconut cult. And I feel like it's really similar to the carnivore diet. It's just that you go to these extremes, and you take like outlying examples, like Paul Saladino, who they look like healthy, even though he's you know apparently he's not healthy anymore on a carnivore diet, and he had to change. Uh, and then you use that. It's like, hey, I have a six pack, so do what I'm doing, what I'm saying. And they use these like very like ancestral arguments. It's like, oh, it's in the sutras in India. It must be good for you. And the carnivore is like, oh, that's like what our ancestors used to do. They would chase like mammoths, even though historically it's probably not true. We, from what I gather, we probably had like more of a omnivorous diet when we grew up uh, as humans, as a race. Um, but I'm not sure. But anyways, I thought it was interesting. And I think I'll probably harken back to that example because it is a fascinating story of people like pushing this little stupid idea to such an extreme. Yeah. Elliot, uh, I think you wanted me to start with the, yeah, we'll get, we'll show an example of this. So maybe what August would be today. Yeah. Um, yeah, show that so guy. this guy is a guy, one of those guys, it's, it's a new trend on Instagram. It's like someone that takes their testosterone levels very seriously. And it's just them like spouting misinformation, uh, like don't touch receipts or whatever, cause there's estrogen in them or whatever. Um, so here we go. I'll play this. So live. The reason you guys are fat is because you come home and drink protein shakes after a workout. You realize that has no nutrients and no cholesterol? How are you going to get your hormones up? How are you going to get your test up? Not from a protein shake. Instead, come back and eat some red meat, which is actually going to give you hormones up and give you way more gains. Everyone, thoughts? That's just, uh, all of this is a consequence of, like you said, a trend um, that, that I think this one has more the reason this one has more like legs than the coconut thing is because meat is like, if you're only eating meat, you can provide most of your nutrients. And mm -hmm. so you can actually survive off that long term. And there's a percentage of people like I'd say maybe 5% of the population who are experiencing reactions to a variety of different foods. Um, so like insoluble fibers, for example, like people with inflammatory bowel disease can sometimes have a hard time with insoluble fibers. Those are in vegetables, um, very high amounts in vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. What are the things that carnivore dieters avoid? Vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. Um, so things like insoluble fibers, um, lectins can be a problem in a very, very small percentage of people. Uh, gluten, for example, can be an issue, uh, milk proteins can be an issue for some people eggs can be an issue for some people so when you go on a carnivore diet which the way that most most of them are doing it is um completely you know one food or just meat and butter red meat and butter and you are in that small percentage of people who is having a reaction to a variety of different foods and and this these people typically have digestive and autoimmune conditions so they have like serious eczema they have inflammatory bowel disease uh, they have lupus, they have other autoimmune diseases that they've been struggling with for a while, and they probably tried other nutrition things. And, yeah. and this guy has come out and said, do this, this is going to solve everything. And you're like, why not? You know, so yeah. this is this is why this is different is because there's that percentage of people who are when they go on a meat and butter diet over the short term, they're removing food sensitivities from, from their diet. They're removing things that they were otherwise reacting to and they're able to meet their nutrient needs because they're able to get enough protein. They're able to get enough of B vitamins. They're able to get enough iron. There's some nutrients that they're going to be missing out on like vitamin C and other things like that. But nutrient deficiencies don't actually set in until weeks, months down the line. And so for the first couple of weeks, these people feel amazing, especially the first couple of months sometimes for, for some of these people with some of these issues. And that is why this thing has just blown up is yeah. because you will see these, these cases, they're all over social media. And, and it's someone who had, you know, very serious case of eczema 
or they were there's just serious autoimmune diseases where they were truly trying to eat healthy. They were trying to live a healthy lifestyle and they were experiencing serious health issues. And when they went carnivore, they removed all of those, like they could have likely gotten similar outcomes, if not the same outcomes with a very strategic personalized diet that removed their specific food sensitivities and actually maintain like provided their nutrient needs like in a more balanced way but it's easier to just go on a meat diet instead of like having professional support and understanding what insoluble fibers are and all these other things that could be potentially problematic for you and so those people are the ones that are causing this trend to completely blow up because they are convinced that this is the the best thing to ever happen to anyone because of how they responded to it. Um, if you were in that situation and you had digestive issues and autoimmune diseases, and now you only eat meat and butter and you feel amazing and you don't have those issues anymore, uh, you're going to think that meat heals, quote unquote. And that's what these people are, you know, they're all over Instagram saying meat heals and everyone needs to go on a carnivore diet because this is what it did for me. And the reality is they just don't understand why it did that for them. If you listen to Paul Saladino, if you hear his story, same thing. Uh, yeah. He had digestive issues, which when I hear it, I'm like, you had some form of inflammatory bowel disease where going off of these insoluble fibers, because insoluble fibers, the fibers that like make up the cell walls of plants, we don't break down fibers and these insoluble fibers, um, they don't absorb water like soluble fibers do. So soluble fibers will absorb water. They create this gel-like structure in our in our digestion. Insoluble fibers don't, and so they create these little, just these small particles in our in our intestines that can kind of scrape the walls of your intestines a little bit. And if you have a breakdown of your mu mucosal lining, because most of us have like a thick mucus layer where it's not a big issue, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna harm you at all. But if you have a breakdown of your mu mucosal lining because you have inflammatory bowel disease or some form of inflammatory bowel disease that insoluble fiber tends to irritate your intestines a little bit, causes more, uh, and this is what I work in. I work with clients with these issues, so this is how I know these things. Um, but, you know, it tends to exacerbate your, like it, it can increase the inflammation a little bit, cause more digestive issues. And so when you go away from that, you feel better immediately, like pretty quickly. And so it's just people who are experiencing benefits of removal of, uh, dietary substances that are that are causing like inflammatory responses in some cases and not understanding why and the 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 main guy who promotes it didn't understand why and he came out and made up all these stories and everyone else is repeating them saying that lectins are toxic and and it's this or that and no, nobody understands why because nobody none of these people actually you know study nutrition uh, enough to understand what yeah. what the hell they're doing. They're just like, oh, I changed my diet and I feel better. Let me come up with an explanation for why this is the case. When like what, like Paul Saladino, the main the main guy who kind of got the carnivore diet popular. Now he currently eats like basically a low insoluble fiber diet. That's that's called a Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Like this is a a medically tested diet. Like he's basically <laughs> promoting a diet that is. Yeah an evidence-based approach to this that has been well known for quite some time. He went so unevidence-based yeah. that he literally oh, he came doesn't around know it, to evidence-based. I know that he crazy. doesn't know he's promoting yeah. that. It's so crazy. But that's what he's promoting essentially. Like yeah. when, when I see that, I'm like, when I saw his, like you said, when I saw him go in the circle and start promoting, I'm like, now he's literally just promoting the Crohn's disease exclusion diet for the most part. And, and it's, it's just, People get popular on storytelling instead of like yeah. science and expertise, unfortunately, and in yeah. the anecdotes. So if you can, if you convince a thousand people to follow a very restrictive diet, doesn't matter what it is, five percent of those people are going to feel better. So same yeah. thing with like medical medium. Um, if I convince a thousand people to follow any restrictive diet that like provide, there there was a there was a milk diet a long time ago. Same thing. They just said, hey, if you're really? I have chronic health issues. This is like early 1900s. If you have chronic health issues, only drink milk and go on a milk detox. And because milk is providing you, you know, a enough of nutrition to keep you alive, that if you're only eating one food and you have enough nutrition to keep you alive, your 
and you have food sensitivities, you're going to be removing all of those. So you might feel yeah. better if you have some of these issues. And with autoimmune and digestive issues, food sensitivities, either either reactions that are occurring at the digestive level, um, like reactions to sometimes like uh, fermentable carbohydrates, for example. So that's another one. Like if you're eating a lot of what are called FODMAPs, that's feeding your gut microbiome, which is a good thing if you have a healthy gut microbiome. But if you don't, if you were drinking raw milk and you got some E. coli in your gut and you and then you try to eat some fiber after that, you're going to be feeding the wrong microbes. And so that's another reason that some people feel better is because a uh, carnivore diet is basically like a dietary antibiotic. And so you're taking away all of the fermentable carbohydrates from the diet. And now a lot of the microbes that were surviving previously in your gut cannot survive there anymore, especially the ones that some of the ones in the small intestine. And so, um, that that can lead to um, improvements in digestive symptoms for some people and autoimmune responses and inflammatory responses in some people. And it's it's not because meat heals. It's because they were their gut microbiome was having negative responses to those fermentable carbohydrates that were helping to feed those those microbes in the stool or in, in the in the intestines. So the, the mechanisms m make sense. I understand why people feel better. It's just the long-term outcomes are, are going to be horrific if people stay on this. That's funny. The only thing, uh, yeah, go ahead. Quick question. Real quick, just a quick question with that guy because I looked at, I just skimmed through some of the comments on that video and one of the things that a lot of people were asking that he wouldn't give a straight up answer to and was kind of obfuscating you know, the truth if he knew it was uh, the link between the dietary cholesterol intake and then how that actually transitions and turns into hormones. Isn't there intrinsic mechanisms that we have as human beings to create those hormones without the need to basically supplement them within our diet? Do we need that high level of cholesterol to then transition and turn no, into all things like testosterone? All the cholesterol they need. It's funny because people will say eat more cholesterol to get turned into hormones and then they'll turn around and say, uh, eat more cholesterol because it doesn't increase cholesterol in your body. It's like, which one is it? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Does it increase cholesterol in the body or does it, does it provide a lot more or does it not increase cholesterol in the body or does it provide a lot more cholesterol for the production of hormones? Um, your, your body produces all of the cholesterol that it needs. Every cell in your body uh, can produce cholesterol endogenously. And then your liver produces a pool of cholesterol to put out into the bloodstream to, to take to where it needs to go. So we, we produce everything that we need in terms of cholesterol. Uh, and that's why when we eat more cholesterol, most people, there's people who are called hyper absorbers or hyper responders who, um, when we eat cholesterol, our liver will just produce less because we don't need more. And that's, you know, every, most people have heard that before. Like when we eat more cholesterol, your liver will produce less because you don't need any more. There are some people who are called just hyper responders or hyper absorbers. When, when they eat more cholesterol, their cholesterol will go way up. Uh, they don't actually have that, that internal mechanism that turns down cholesterol production. And that's some of those people, you know, they hear some of this carnivore diet stuff. They go, they eat 10 eggs a day, which is a shit ton of cholesterol and then they their their ldl cholesterol goes through the roof um yeah. and that that's can be problematic so these would be like your your thin people and you're like oh you're doing cholesterol They're like oh yeah it's genetic these kind of people i guess yeah so um some of those people but cholesterol is not largely driven by um body mass uh cholesterol is largely genetic and largely um composition of diet mm -hmm. Uh, so excess body fat, excess adiposity can, will increase cholesterol output, like just as a result of a buildup of fat in the liver that will then get kind of converted into, um, or like packaged into LDL particles with some cholesterol. Uh, but in general, um, yeah, it's, uh, like there's not a strong correlation and weight loss isn't a strong uh, like it's not a great way to reduce cholesterol. It's largely dietary composition. So saturated fat, fiber are the two main things. Like if you're eating very high amounts of saturated fat, your uh, liver will reduce LDL clearance because it's it has to shuttle that fat out into the bloodstream in order to get into the cells. And it packages up some cholesterol into those LDL particles along with the with the fatty acids. And for some reason, saturated fat does that to a greater degree than other types of fats. Um, and, and so that's why that can increase LDL cholesterol. And then fiber 
fiber binds to bile in our gut and helps to eliminate that bile. And then uh, your body will use the cholesterol in the liver to produce more bile. And when it does that, it will suck cholesterol out of the blood in order to put more in the liver. And so that will reduce your LDL, LDL cholesterol level too. But those are like the two main dietary components that impact uh, overall LDL cholesterol level. Um, yeah, weight isn't as strong a per, uh, of a predictor. And that's why you see these, a lot, of the, uh, pretty much all these carnivore people, they're super lean and they got, yeah. they have LDL cholesterol levels of 300 plus. Yeah. That's why we have an expert here. Cause I didn't know that. Um, yeah. yeah, the whole time you were talking about the, how like the carnivore diet started because, you know, uh, Paul Saladino maybe had bowel issues. It just reminded me how a lot of people, well, some experts think that world war two was that bad because Hitler was erratic because he, do you guys know he had like really bad fart and it was like a huge is issue. <laughs> I didn't know he had this. really, really bad farts. And one of the reasons why he was taking so many drugs is because his doctor gave him a bunch of stuff. And it was like a, you know, a happy doctor would just give him so many pills. I think at one point he had like 40 pills a day or something insane. But the, the pill that worked for his farts was strychnine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with strychnine. No. <laughs> it's like rat poison. But also long term, it makes you like super aggressive and it messes messes with your brain. So a lot of the decisions he was making would end up with like countless lives lost. And people were like, yeah, he's, he's tweaking. And you can attribute some of this for him not wanting to fart because he would have meetings with people and be like, yeah, I'm just farting. You, you can't take me seriously. And that doctor was like, yeah, just take this. And then he stopped farting. He was like, that's great. You're my doctor now. So um, I guess, yeah, bowel issues can create. That's awesome. You know what? <laughs> Hitler was taking trend. I, I've heard awesome. this. I don't know if this is true, but Hitler I've heard that Hitler trend. is a vegan. I've heard that too. Yeah, like almost. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard something like that. So, he was either a vegan or he like didn't, he, he, he didn't eat red meat or something. But yeah, yeah. So slight correction, according to most historical reports, Hitler was a vegetarian. Would say that yeah. the solution is he should have just went carnivore. Because <laughs> yeah. they would have removed the fermentable carbohydrates from his system and he would stop farting. Uh, yeah. There you go. Now we're talking. Yeah, yeah there we go. That's um, how we bring on the experts. Also, another thing that it reminded me of was that, <laughs> you know, essentially what you were describing is that these carnivores are accidentally going on an elimination diet. And I think Elliot and I see a very common parallel in that a lot of people, they'll fall for these movement cults because they're like, oh, I was doing the powerlifting like five times a week. And I was like, you know, I was maxing out every week and I was struggling to gain mass. And it's like, yeah, maybe first of all, you have like bad genetics. You're not someone that gains weight easily and you're comparing yourself to people online or you don't know that they're on gear or you're just bad at training. And then you get injured all the time. And then you find this like little movement cult. And if you notice most of the, almost all these movement cults are low load, weird activities of something we don't really load a lot. So it's like something you don't do during the day. So it's very unlikely that this movement's pattern is going to be overloaded. Like the prime example would be like functional patterns where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I was training like actual loading every day at super incredibly high loads with no rest. And I felt terrible. And then I started spinning and they told me I don't need to be like buff, apparently being buff is bad. It just means you're, you're compressed or whatever. Just like the way the carnivals say like, yeah, cholesterol is actually great for you. The more cholesterol you have, the higher your test is. So that's great. So it's the same thing. It's just, they accidentally discovered like load management and like relative rest and they feel better because they live somewhere closer to the middle, but they take it to the extreme where it's like, yeah, it's the solution to everything. Mm. You have a fracture, you just need to spin more. And it's like, oh, you have, you know, like Hitler was a bad guy. Just make him eat more meat. I'm exaggerating, but it's just, you take, they always take one idea to the extreme. And I think part of it is partly accelerated by the algorithm. Cause it's like, I don't know if you've ever tried, like my page is a bit, like I go up and down. I do like a complete shit post about like penis size or like I have one on Huberman where it's just like Huberman says like the saunas are great for you and it reduces infections. And then I found a study on like uh, sauna habits and gay men in China. And it's like, they, it increases the risk of having HPV. Cause like, obviously there's just unprotected sex there. I just go, what about this? And it's just, it, you know, I can't do a post like this cause it doesn't fit with the other posts. So the algorithm is very, it trying to pigeonholes you into this very niche way. So I feel like there's probably carnivores who try to maybe go out of that land and be like, Hey, maybe the government's not always that bad. Maybe like, I don't know, take your vaccines or something. And they were like, no, no, you can't do that. Cause it's like that very niche thing you need to be in that very specific uh, frame where you can't get out of. Uh, so I think 
again, I think the internet is kind of accelerating this precipitation of misinformation, if that makes sense. Because they all look like each other. I don't know if you've noticed. They have the cutting board. They're shirtless. They're talking about testosterone. The government wants to control you. It's almost like they have a script. And it's funny because they all present themselves as free thinkers. But they all say the same thing. Oh, they, they all say the exact same. They're all repeating <laughs> yeah. what they're all trying to do. Be Paul, Paul Saladino. It's like a mm-hmm. whole bunch of guys because they just saw how popular he got. The guy yeah. got really popular eating a bunch of meat and recording himself doing it. And so a bunch of people try to do that. And the algorithm works to, to their favor when you're when you have a cutting board with raw meat and you're shirtless and you, you show yourself eating that like uh if anything, people are going to comment negative things. But the the cool thing that I've seen recently, and I think this is going to help shift Instagram a little bit, the content that's on there, is it used to be that they would just show your content to people who had very, very similar interests. And they would keep everyone in a little echo chamber. Now, they're, they seem to be throwing like, when posts start to go viral, they'll show it to everyone. Yeah. And if you go on any of these carnivore guys post over the last two months you'll find that the it, anything that went viral that didn't just get shown to their their following like anything that has like a little bit more engagement they're getting bashed left and right and that wasn't happening two months ago so i think the algorithm has changed again to where yeah you know they're trying to make discoverability like you know put you out to new people and like test out putting people's content to, to new audiences and this is like helping to regulate some of this craziness a little bit because, you know, it's one thing because two years ago or even five months ago, I'd say, because I saw a post recently that these these women were doing, um, uh, what is it, the the uh, coffee enemas. Oh, yeah, we <laughs> talked about it on one of the last episode. Yeah, this is outrageous. Yeah, they were so, cheering with the enema. Yeah. Oh, that yes, that's the video. Yeah, yeah. So I saw that video and I was like a year ago on Instagram, it would have only been crazy wellness people commenting on that yeah. and being like, what do you mean? Oh you don't do God, it? I need you to do try that? this. No, definitely. Oh, okay. I mean, Elliot and I, we're actually a fun. Elliot and I do that every day. <laughs> we're doing that after this. Yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, do it twice a week. Yeah, but, sure. I can't then, go to sleep without my anima. This is just wild, though. And and it used to be the way that the algorithm worked is you'd look under there and there'd be nothing but positive comments. Yeah. And if I left the comment of like, you should probably not do this, people would be like, oh, you're paid for it by the FDA, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, and now, um, like I saw that video two days ago, and I looked at the comments. And it was pretty much 95% of people like, you guys need to get therapy and then a lot of funny stuff actually some great yeah. comments in there yeah. about how ridiculous that trend is but in my opinion that's probably gonna help some people wake up like if you've been in an echo chamber around this yeah. wellness stuff and then you see this comment section of pe- people who aren't completely mentally disturbed uh actually commenting like some logical things on there like i think that's gonna help some people out yeah, and I do want to go back to something you touched on. I think it was pretty good. You talked about um, how there's like this 5% maybe that's going to respond to something completely crazy just by virtue of going by elimination. I think it kind of highlights one thing, like one of the pitfalls of the science that we use in general is that what we use is averages for populations. And it's really hard to like find like specific responders because usually if you do that in post, it's like you transform your randomized control trial into just a, ge- a regular trial. So it kind of messes up the study. So we, you know, the future hopefully will be personalized medicine where we're like, oh, you have this like specific genetic subtype or epigenetic subtype. And then so you should have maybe this diet that's better for you. And then you just do a test and it's done. We can't, as far as I know, can't really do that now unless it's like trial and error. But the problem is that, yeah, you get these people that fall in the cracks. And I do feel some empathy for, for these people. At some level, I'm like, yeah, okay, you're exaggerating. You're putting people's health at risk. There was a lot of people where it's just like they tried everything and it's just the way science works. It's like for most people, it's probably bad. And that, again, it kind of falls on this point that I was making that it's just, they take it to the extreme because they found that one thing. It's like these born again, Christian people were like, you know, everything that's not in the Bible is the devil. Like, oh, you wear blue. That's the devil. I'm exaggerating, obviously. 
Uh, but it's just, you know, everything can be taken to an extreme that's bad. Same thing with veganism, where, um, uh, what was I talking about? The, the completely lost my train of thought. I was talking about carnivores. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're like, you know, it worked for me. So it should work for everyone and you should do it every day, all the time. And you, you know, you don't have any fibers or whatever. And I think that's problematic that there's no middle ground because there could be like harm reduction approaches. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but if someone just wants to eat red meat, if they took like, let's say vitamin C supplements and fibers and whatever else is missing, would that work to some degree? Oh, so I've had clients who have inflammatory bowel disease who respond poorly to most plant foods. And so um, we work around that, you know, take a multivitamin, yeah. drink juice, um, include the plant foods that, that you can tolerate well. Um, but in those cases, and this is why oftentimes I get pushback from some of these people when I criticize like carnivore diets, yeah. because they'll come into the comments and I understand, but they, they don't understand that I work in this field and I'm criticizing the carnivore <laughs> diet from the trend that's being promoted as opposed yeah. to like what might help an individual. But, um, yeah, there, there's, you know, I, I work with. GI and autoimmune conditions like this. This is how I know. And this is where, what you go back to, like that stuff gets lost in the data. And that's why I kind of emphasized at the beginning that I've worked with a lot of people because it's one thing to read the science, <laughs> but it's quite a, yeah. quite a different thing. And there's there's not a lot of people who are doing both. Uh, yeah. Very, very few. There's a lot of people in academia who are academics and there's you know a lot of people who are like coaches and things who, who didn't actually get deep into the science or don't actually yeah. read into the science. And um, you know, all of the things that I explained earlier, the only reason I understand this is because I read the literature on my own and then applied it into my actual practice uh, and saw responses and, and, you know, kind of can can explain it from the, from that perspective. And yeah, there's there's that percentage who who that they, yeah, that's the thing. They don't need to be on a red meat diet forever. Even those yeah. people um, they're they're benefiting from avoiding certain foods not because they're only eating red meat. And, and a lot of times um, they're getting some of the nutrients that they haven't been getting enough of because they've been eating other foods that are disrupting their digestion so much. And so, for example, the B12, the zinc, the iron, the vitamin A, all of these nutrients, like they're getting really high amounts of these nutrients and they're be able to absorb them because some of that inflammation is down from their gut and, and the fiber kind of fiber will bind to some nutrients and reduce absorption. And so if they're eating a lot and you'll hear this a lot too, people go from a long-term vegan diet uh, to a carnivore diet and they say they feel amazing and, it, and it's, it's because of nutrient deficiency. It's like, uh, it's going to be the same thing around that you can, if you take a lot of carnivores three, three years in, and then you put them on a really nutritious vegan diet, they're going to feel incredible because they're going to get all of the nutrients that they were lacking. Um, it's going to always work both ways because, because the answer is in the middle uh, to yeah. get all the nutrients. You got to be in the middle and you got to be including everything. And that's, you know, when you mentioned the harm reduction, uh, that's where the right information is important because helping people to um, understand why they might be having these responses um, takes them out of the feeling like they just have to follow a carnivore diet and realizing that they can include other things and maybe they can have some green juice because there's no fibers in there and you can get, you know, some of the celery and other nutrients, uh, nutrients from like celery and carrots and other foods. Um, if you juice it and take away those fibers that, that you can't tolerate well, and there's, there's many ways to go about it and actually still follow a nutritious diet and, and not, you know, build your diet around 90 grams of saturated fat per day, um, which is just, you know, these people are just, it, that's the part that frustrates me is I know that there's people who are benefiting yeah. um, that really have like chronic health issues, but they would benefit so much more from the right information. But how do you, how do you get that to people without this crazy extremism? Like you can't, you can't package it in a way that's going to get them. Yeah. Especially if they benefit from yeah. it. That's, so, that's so hard. Like if someone benefits from the carnivore diet, it's just like if someone benefits from something in the clinic that's like an obscure exercise, there's almost no way to necessarily get them off track or to get them to stop believing that that exercise is like something passed down by their deity himself. 
um, without giving them like a rational supplement that they could actually go out and then test against their own theory. So like whenever I see on social media, like the guy who's lost a hundred or 200 pounds with a carnivore diet, I'm like, that's awesome. That's incredible. But I just, I just wish there was a way that we could introduce like that person implementing, you know, vitamin C, some fruits some vegetables in a way that would have contrast with the ideas so abruptly that they could no longer be carnivore, at least like socially in their mind as in terms of like what, what they perceive to be carnivore. Like a lot of people will just eat red meat and butter when like you can still be carnivore by eating like eggs and poultry and fish. And it's like, why are we stuck on the red it, meat and it, butter? It's because, um, for some of those people, they're probably having reactions to fish and eggs too. And that's why they're sticking to red meat and butter. Uh, because eggs are a very common food sensitivity. Mm, and I was so going to ask you about that, yeah. And uh, all of... And the, the, this mm. is why like, this is why it's important to understand nutrition when you're discussing yeah. these. Because it, it's... Uh, they're just common food allergies. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top eight allergies, eggs and, eggs and fish are up there. And so I, I'll have clients who come to me and they're you know, they have digestive and, and autoimmune issues and, and they never hear that. No one ever talks about, oh, eggs can actually be, you hear gluten, you hear soy, you hear uh, these things. Well, eggs and fish are like right up there with those in terms right. of like potential food allergies uh, and they can exacerbate. Yeah, everything. Do you see a on. dose response with that stuff? Oh, for sure. Like can yeah, someone um, eat like a little bit, in like, right? Um, okay, yeah. Extreme cases, everything's dose response. And then everything is also... I mean, it's just like rehab. Everything is also like going to be dependent on everything else going on. So like someone might have a reaction to eggs when they slept mm -hmm. poorly and uh, had a hard training session the day before, but not not if they are, you know, well rested and, and you know, didn't. Or like, for example, um, w when you mm -hmm. go for a run or when you do any type of like high intensity exercise, you, you there's some intestinal permeability that occurs in individuals who have... Um, like food sensitivities, sometimes they will react more to things that they eat right before they run. And so it's just a matter of like switching when they eat, uh, when they eat those foods. Like maybe they can, you know, like for example, I had a client that she would have a bagel before she ran and it would always like, she was having all these digestive issues and uh, she's like, I can eat, you know, I can eat wheat other times. And I'm like, yeah, probably, but it's, you know, in these cases, <laughs> your gut's becoming a little bit more permeable and uh, that can lead to the immune system, like you know, coming in contact with certain proteins that it's not supposed to, uh, and, and causing certain types of reactions. Can you explain, you talked about food insensitivity. That's something I never really understood. Can you explain the difference between a straight up allergy and an insensitivity? I can't say. Okay. Uh, so there, there's, there's different ways that people, um, yeah. describe sensitivities that the sensitivities or intolerances is like the main Intolerances is a better way to describe it. It's basically any reaction to a food that's not an allergy. So an allergy is going to be every time you eat a food, you have an immunological reaction to that food. And that immunological reaction is going to show up as like hives. It's going to show up as um, like an immune system response. So maybe sneezing, some type of reaction that your immune system is clearly activated after you eat that food. That's, sure. what, that's what a food allergy is. Yeah. An intolerance is anything else that's not that. And so they're, they're immune mediated intolerances where sometimes the immune system will come into contact with certain things like I was describing before, and that'll lead to a little bit of an inflammatory response. And, and that, you know, that that's, those are called immune, uh, immune driven intolerances. And then there's non immune mediated intolerances. Like, for example, if someone has uh, acid reflux and they drink coffee, uh, that that's a non immune mediated intolerance, like they'll just have some some upper GI discomfort, and that's an intolerance to coffee um, that's not driven by the immune system. And so these intolerant, there's, you know, this gets really complicated talking about all of the different intolerances yeah. and, and, and things. But um, like, for example, bloating, a lot of people think that that's an immune mediated intolerance. Oftentimes, it's not, um, it can be the immune system can lead to like the immune system can exacerbate like a, a, a pain response in the gut. But um, bloating is is gas production oftentimes as a result of the fermentation of, of carbohydrates and so that's not the immune system that's production of gas by those microbes in your gut and so the immune system can impact the way that you experience the bloating but the bloating itself is not immune mediated um it's probably a little bit too complicated to get into but it, there, there's various different types of responses that's why these things are difficult is because there's also 
there's also not a lot of nutrition practitioners who understand any of this stuff. Like I, this is all because of my experience and because I've read pretty much every paper on GI issues and, and nutrition that's been published over the last you know 20 years. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's so much more complex than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy that you say that. Yeah, I get I get distension and bloating. This is super funny. And I'm just like, it's funny because I always talk about like load tolerance and like progressive overload and like when you should pay attention <laughs> to your symptoms, except when it comes to me, you know what I mean? Like we're our worst patients. I eat the majority of my fiber at night or if I do, I get like rampant stomach cramps and I can barely sleep. If I front load it to the like the beginning of the day, I have zero issues with my GI. So it's like, that's something that I was like, oh, this is probably just placebo. Like, it's just fine. But now that you say it, I'm like, oh, I should probably yeah, like cut yeah. back the, on that. Things, or fix uh, it. Uh, nutrition. That's why I like this topic is, uh, you know, I, I initially got a master's degree in exercise science and then I was like, damn, nutrition is so complicated. And like, there's just so much more to learn uh, that, that that's what kind of drove me to, to going to get a, new, a PhD in nutrition. Plus I had digestive issues myself that I was pretty much, I mean, I, I completely solved completely got rid of just by making dietary changes and kind of learning more about this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is like a piece of healthcare that's missing. Like no one's getting access to the right information in a healthcare space. Like if you have digestive issues and you go to a, you can go to 25 different doctors and almost none of them are going to refer you to a, to a GI uh, dietitian who's actually going to be able to help you in any way. And that's like, I mean, that's why I do what I do now is because, you know, these clients are, uh, that I work with now are usually have been a, many, many people and dealt with stuff for, for decades and have never like actually gotten any evidence-based nutrition guidance, which is like the most important thing when it comes to some of these, some of these issues. Yeah. Like I don't personally have a referral source for like an evidence-based nutritionist, but I just know like the prevalence of people who are willing to uptake like the mantle of like pseudo nutritionist or dietary or uh, registered dietitian is like, there's a myriad of different practitioners who are like, no, I could do that for you. And the first thing obviously that comes to mind is like the chiropractor who's like, you have IBS. How about you try goat milk and uh, beetroot powder? And it's like, that's probably not going to solve it, dude. But then you don't know who to refer yeah, to. So I, it's I'd like, say you know, probably a tough. third of my clients have worked with a chiropractor who's done some wild shit. A lot of cases. <laughs> yeah. It's I've really bad. Yeah, it's really testing, bad. Uh, you know, food sensitivity testing. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. Some crazy yeah. stuff. Is there any relevance or any um, benefit to that? Food sensitivity testing? Yeah, bring so that it up? goes back like to what rampant. I just said is um, a large percentage of food sensitivities are non-immune mediated. And these food sensitivity tests, they only test one antibody. And so in the immune, like even, even with immune mediated reactions, there's a wide variety of different immune mediated reactions that can occur. And they, they, we can't measure them. They're, they're, they can, there's different antibodies and different responses that occur. Those food sensitivity tests, they test what's called IgG. Um, this is a measure of tolerance. Like it's actually not a measure of intolerance. There's th those, those tests are so scammy. It frustrates me because people come to me with them and they've been avoiding these foods and they're like, I don't feel any better. It's like, because this is literally just a business. Like that, the, the IgG food sensitivity test is yeah hundred <laughs> percent just a scammy business for the most part. Yeah, I so I'm also like a performance coach and I have like, not like younger kids and like, you know, younger adult athletes come in and like, they're distraught and they're like, Oh my God, like the chiropractor that I went to before you, like, you know, I, I got this food sensitivity test and apparently I'm allergic to chicken, beef, rice, sweet potatoes, anything that has sugar in it. Um, uh, aspartame. I'm like, dude, where are you getting this information from? And it's hard for me to combat it because my inf I, I don't know how to combat those, you know, IG tests that yeah. you're talking about before yeah, talking to you just right now. It's difficult because uh, it, even describing it's just hard. It's just a BS test and it's hard for people to, to it's, it's difficult to think about like, how is this company advertising on social media? How do they have this massive multi-million dollar, they're, at, they're doing Super Bowl ads. Like how do they do this with a BS test? Um, but unfortunately, in in the United States and in in Western countries, uh, this is this happens less outside of like North America because I work with clients all over the world. This happens less elsewhere. But around here, healthcare is one of the most profitable businesses, and and uh, there's just 
company after company after company just making money off of manipulating people, um, lying to people. And, and the, yeah, these, these tests, there's no, the science is just not there. there every single medical society um, that, that has anything to do with allergies or sensitivities or digestive issues has come out and said, hey, these food sensitivity tests are pointless. Um, but, you know, the, the, they don't have $50 million of marketing to get that message out while Everly Well and the other, the other companies can just pump a whole bunch of money into saying, take this test and, and make people believe it. And by the time everyone takes these tests and realize they're BS, you know, these companies make so much money that, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Turns out maybe having a for-profit healthcare in a system that also has a uh, freedom of speech with almost no restriction might be a bad idea. Yeah. It's really surprising to me. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I capitalism do, I, capitalism on overdrive. Though, so there's that. I'm like half communist through my mom. So, um, cause she's Canadian. She's not actually communist. I love you, mom. Um, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I would, I should start selling like food sensitivity testing and be like, it turns out girl, you're just allergic to fake people. And then I just tell her to stop talking to her dad or something. Um, <laughs> Okay, on a serious note, I do want to talk because we touched on that 5%. I think the most representative person might be Michaela P Peterson. I don't know if you're familiar. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to just show a video of her. She's very convinced. She's a really good talker. Fun fact, also, she went to Concordia University, which, like, I played soccer, soccer against them when I played for McGill. They're, like, the – apparently, they're supposed to be the most liberal university in the world, like, literally, or in North America. They're extremely left-wing. It's, like – they, they have pronouns. You have to tell your pronouns before class, before doing like a presentation. If you can take whatever you want, but it's just funny because it's like that demon that Jordan Peterson is talking about is probably just because Michaela went to school there and was like, oh, I had really bad gout today. And then the teacher made me call like use pronouns. And it's just like, I understand you might not want to use alternative pronouns if you're like dying on the inside because you have like horrible symptoms of autoimmune disease or whatever. And your dad's Jordan Peterson. So... <laughs> Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna stop it there, but let's watch a footage from Michaela. All right. I was breastfeeding, getting out of bed. My wrist buckled. I thought I have to do something because I'm worried I'm gonna drop my baby. The arthritis was back. I was itchy everywhere. And I was like, how is this possible? If I'd experienced remission, why isn't that diet working anymore? And I cut everything out except for beef. And two weeks after doing that, thinking I'm nuts, hopefully I don't get vitamin deficiencies, the itch went away and my joints started to feel better. Four weeks after that, I stopped crying in the morning. And five months after that, the anxiety lifted and I was back in what I felt was heaven compared to how I'd been living. All beef, all lamb, salt, and water. My mom went on the diet and her osteoarthritis went away my dad went on the diet and he lost 70 pounds kids just the way she's describing it as a clinician uh, lead you can back me up on this a lot of things she's saying is just like why would this happen and then why would it go away is just you know maybe it's just natural history and sometimes it's not because your wrist buckle that you know your disease activity is back it's just, sometimes just shit happens and i feel like a lot of patients especially people with chronic pain they struggle with that that's why i there's a whole field that's just like acceptance uh, therapy, which is kind of in vogue for chronic pain. It's just, you know, yeah, you're going to have pain. It sucks. But there's part of you that's going to ha have to, you know, accept that there's going to be flare ups and it's more about managing them than finding a magic cure all. Because, you know, sometimes life is unfair, which is really, it sucks, you know. Uh, Adrian, do you have some thoughts before I kind of go on a rant? Yeah. So, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, like, yeah, I believe her. Um, yeah. She's part of the 5%. I, I've, I, I've worked with those people. I've had conversations with many, many people who, who are in that boat. Um, and that that's the problem is generalizing the 5% to the hundred. Yeah. And, and, and she does, she's not aware of that. She thinks anyone who has any autoimmune condition is going to feel better on her diet. Uh, when reality is like, you know, some people with autoimmune diseases feel better on a vegetarian diet. Uh, you know, some people feel better on, on various types of diets. The, the key with autoimmune conditions, like nutrition matters in many cases, makes a big difference. And so typically it requires going on something more, more extreme to feel that difference. So, and so it's like whoever can convince these people to go on the, the first extreme diet, they're going to feel great on. Um, Cause like, as I mentioned a second ago, a lot of times it's food sensitivities and intolerances. So like 
if you're having pizza a couple times a week, if you're having in, processed foods of various sorts, you're going to be exposing yourself to wheat and all other potential um, potential things that could could exacerbate those intolerances. So whoever can convince them to completely go all in on one diet uh, is is usually going to be like, you know, they're going to feel better on those things uh, in the short term, unfortunately. And uh, that's the problem is just a lack of good education. Uh, like you just showed a lot of people know Michaela Peterson's story, but, you know, very, very few people are actually getting exposed to any good education on this topic. Like this is anything that I'm talking to you guys about. You're like, oh, this is the first time I've heard that. Yeah. Most people, <laughs> this is the first time they heard any of this stuff. Uh, and you guys are familiar with the carnivore diet. You know what I mean? You're familiar with this trend. And, and most people don't understand some of these reasons why people do feel better. Because uh, I talk about it on my podcast. It, it helps to understand like the actual yeah. mechanisms. And that's why when you mentioned mechanisms earlier, it's like helps to understand the mechanisms of why people actually feel better so that you can avoid <laughs> having to go down that path as well. Because like you can still... Like, for example, I mentioned reducing fermentable carbohydrates. If you if you have a microbiome that doesn't respond to them well, you can do that without going carnivore. You know what I mean? If you have IBS, you can you can take away fermentable carbohydrates to reduce them without going carnivore. You can you can avoid gluten without going carnivore if you have some variation of some non celiac gluten sensitivity. And that's what's happening is people have sensitivities and they're taking everything out. It's like, you know, you needed a hammer to, to hammer in a nail, but you use a sledgehammer instead. And you like, you don't need that. <laughs> like that's too much. Yeah. Uh, just use the hammer so that you don't cause this damage on the long term. because these, so we haven't talked about it as much on this podcast, but it should be obvious. Like only eating meat is going to cause problems over the long run. <laughs> you're going to develop nutrient. Yeah. We have a section dedicated to that. Yeah. No. Worries. Okay. You're, you're going to develop nutrient deficiencies. You're going to, you're going to increase your risk of heart disease, increase your risk of cancer. Like, um, yeah. and it's going to be hard to live your life like a normal life. You, you're going to have to like isolate yourselves in, in, in various ways in some cases. Yeah. But one thing I do find interesting, you're talking about mechanisms is why it's important to understand them. For me in general, for the common people, like common people, that sounds like I'm an aristocrat or something. Like the general population, it, it feels to me <laughs> that like understanding the mechanisms is almost harmful and they should just focus on the effects because I feel like in general, it's even for the carnivore diet, I feel like they're using mechanisms to obfuscate actual clinical data. They'll be like, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll pick like like some opposite. Go obscure ahead, go ahead. mechanism. Like, what is it? Like the oxalates in vegetables or whatever, like the defense chemicals in vegetables. Yeah, whatever the they are. And they're like, and, these are yeah. bad and they're present in like vegetables. So don't eat vegetables. Okay. Whereas you go, we got tons of meta-analyses showing that like, vegetable intake is like directly correlated to reduce mortality. We have like the, I'll put it on screen. Actually, I'll share my screen. Um, hang on. And I'm not teaching you this. I'm doing this for the audience. Yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, hang on. Yeah. So he's the... like, dude, yeah, I know, dude. <laughs> Wait, you need to eat fruits. <laughs> no idea. Okay. So f first of all, we got to acknowledge no the name of the scientist. I'm sorry. I know you did a, you're a doctor and a scientist and you probably did some great work, but you're not, your name is Dong D Wang, right? Come on. Um, so metallicis from 2021 fruit and vegetable intake Wait. and mortality results from two perspectives, cohort studies of us men and women and a metallicis of 26 cohort studies. So basically a higher intake of fruit and vegetable were associated with lower mortality. The risk reduction plateaued at approximately five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. These findings support current dietary recommendations to increase intake of fruits and vegetables, but not fruit juices and potatoes. And the effect size was about 12% for uh, cardiovascular mortality and for cancer was about 0.65, uh, sorry, 35%. So reduce, uh, death in general. Uh, no, that was for respiratory disease. Total mortality was 12%. Cancer was 10%. And yeah, uh, respiratory disease, 35%. I'm kind of surprised that it's better for vegetables, uh, for a respiratory disease, like fruits. That doesn't make sense to me. Is I, there a I, reason? It's, it's always lower. I'm, I'm always surprised why that is. I, I, I never understood that. Like it's yeah. maybe immune system health, but the, the, the risk reduction for respiratory conditions is always lower with fruit and vegetable consumption, like pretty significantly lower. Um, so th this, this study, there's, 
that's pretty consistent. Like 10 to 15% risk reduction for cancer. Usually cardiovascular disease is 15 to 20%. And then respiratory disease is like 25 ish. Like that's, that's most meta analyses show that, um, yeah. Yeah, it's wild to be able to argue against that. Like yeah. people who eat more plant foods have better is, health outcomes. Yeah. Is that age adjusted? Because one thing I learned in university might have been bullshit. Is just if you technically look at fruits and vegetables, it technically increases cancers because you live longer, so you have more chances of contracting cancer. Is that so? The twelve yeah, percent is that even yeah, if you live longer, you'll still have lower risk. Yeah, all of that's age adjusted. It's adjusted okay, for okay, physical okay. activity. Adjusted socioeconomic status like they, they they perform observational studies they, they do crazy statistical analyses like you have to if oh, yeah. you're writing one of those papers you got to have a, a a really smart statistician on board and and then when you send it into peer review they're double checking all of those statistics and interesting the way they do them but in my opinion they underestimate because when we look at randomized controlled trials uh people tend to like the, the benefits tend to be higher with lower, lower amounts. And yeah. uh, the reason I think they underestimate is because people just say they eat healthier. Like people are going to, if people say they eat five servings, they probably eat three, you know, <laughs> like the, the, the reality is everyone wants to say they eat healthier than they actually do. And, and there's some ways to check and, you know, they're, they're they've done, uh, you know, reliability studies on these, these food frequency questionnaires that are used. But generally, as someone who has administered tons of these, who has reviewed tons of these, this, I did this during my PhD. We ran multiple studies where I was running, you know, food frequency questionnaires and three-day food records. And people are just, they want to say they ate healthier than they did. <laughs>